We live. You're live now. Oh wow. We are live. I'm gonna open up YouTube so I can see comments. Good morning. Good morning. Are you just gonna hold your microphone like that? I think so. You have a pretty cool thing, but you're a lot shorter than I am. <laughs> well, I'm also, I have to hunch down. So this is. Hey, there's, there's three people watching. Already. Three people already. Hello, the faithful few. Welcome. Uh, yeah, I got okay. I got it pulled up. I can see comments. All right. Maybe we should ask our viewers to comment and tell us if our audio sounds okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mine sounds like I'm in a can. It doesn't sound like that to me. Okay. Your angle is interesting. That's for sure. I'm going like this. No, no your camera. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got Hannah All Schroeder. All right. She's a, she's a Facebook fan of the show. So nice. Seen her around. Um, yeah, I think it's all working. All right. Hey, you, uh, Sean, you sent me a quote this morning. Mm -hmm. On the internet, there is no age threshold where an adolescent receives more freedom and responsibility based on growth and maturity. On the internet, you can learn about anal sex before you kiss a boy. Yeah, from Jonathan Hayes. That's a paraphrase. Yeah. Where, where is that on? It's, a, it's from his new book, the anxious, the anxious Age where he basically contrasts children growing up in the real world versus children growing up on a screen. And he talks about how that's a big driver in a lot of uh, the neuroses we see in, in children these days. Yeah. And he, he makes the point like, it used to be that children growing up in the real world would hit these certain milestones of development where parents would say, oh, I think I can trust you now to go do more and more and more. You yeah. get access to the car on a Friday night, but be home by 10. But now if you click a box on the internet that says that I'm 18, you can go anywhere and do anything and see anything and pretend to be anyone. Yeah, one of many very good points being made in that book. Which is wild because the same generation growing up right now mm -hmm. that has unfettered access to adult materials and ideas also can't drive cars. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or like use pocket knives, like simple yes. life skills. So they're missing some of the real world milestones uh -huh. and they've advanced well beyond what they're probably emotionally and psychologically ready yeah. for with adult content. Well, let's go back to the, not to be crude, but to the sexual analogy that he uses. Yeah. You know, you can literally watch human beings have intercourse without having the nerve to walk up and say hello to a girl. Right. Or ever having had your first kiss. You know. Crazy. Uh, Crazy. Hey, that reminds me of, um, there's a, a law in Florida that just, I think the governor just signed it into law, banning teenagers from having social media accounts. And I wonder how that works. Yeah. How, how, how can you enforce that? Yeah. Do you, hey, will you pull that up? <laughs> yeah, I think um, we got our Jamie. We got our Jamie. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like 14 and under, but I can't imagine how how you can enforce that. Well, I know that China has a law like this already, but they're China, right? They, so they've got the systems in place. Yeah, to make if, sure you're never on your phone. If again. they find your 12 year old on TikTok, uh, he's going to a concentration camp. Yeah. he's going to be up there with the week. Yeah, you'll be making iPhones uh, cage somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. But how here in the ostensibly free United States will that work? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, you see it? It's on. It's on. You get a screen shared on. It prohibits social media platform from allowing children younger than fourteen to have an account. Uh, what does it say? How? How? Yeah, do they do that? I don't think it does say how. Okay, and uh, I wonder if they just don't even know. I wonder. <laughs> I wonder if they expect this to really just be like, uh, almost like perfunctory. Like this is a position we're taking even though we know it's yeah. going to be pretty hard to enforce well maybe if any of our fans all all dozen of them watching this if they know let us know post yeah. the link do you think it's anything i, I do. do um this is another thing that jonathan hate another point that jonathan hate h-a-i-d-t not h-a-t-e makes in the book which by the way Lest I be accused of recommending this book without any qualifications he's an evolutionary psychologist so a lot of his sort of describing issues right now is very good because he's good with observation. Mm -hmm. A lot of his explanation as to why that is the case yeah. is completely... <laughs> There's a lot of books like that. A lot of books. Can you ignore the evolutionary biology that explains why things are mm -hmm. the way they are? Mm -hmm. Hey, who's calling? Uh, this may... 
<laughs> this is Terry. Collins. Is this a fan? Maybe. <laughs> uh, hello, Russell. Yeah, who's this? This is Mickey Gentle. Hey, I gotta call you back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, brother. Okay, no worries. All right, take care. What kind of unprofessional? This whole show is gonna be. Do you want to turn your ringer off? Or you no, have it on I have to have it on. For you. So no. I have a second line that's the call in line for the show. Okay. Terry Collins, who uh, is going to be our guest, which we haven't really announced yet. Okay. She has my number. So okay. I got to keep that line up for her when she calls in. She's calling in. The but she's going to call in on your phone? Yeah. And then how will that get onto the internet? Uh, the magic of technology. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, wow. I think this is a pretty wild ride so far. So far. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think. Uh, I, I like fourteen year olds. Oh, uh, back to that. Would not be able to be on social media. If yes, it's, it's possible. Yeah. Of course. But I feel a little torn because I don't like the government telling people what they can and can't mm -hmm. do with information platforms. Mm -hmm. What one of the things I think I, I keep running into is just the moral complexity of prior events. So, like in principle, I don't really want the state to tell me what my kids can't do with with internet platforms. And yet the state in prior events has done, like think about how much schools, public schools in particular, have, have pushed technology on kids. If there's not a public school around anymore, it doesn't give kids iPads, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, like that has to factor into your judgment. Like if you've kind of created this problem, maybe the state now does have some more moral obligation to fix it. Hmm. So just something to think about. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how to untangle that knot. I, what I do know is that we have enough data, even, so this is the same guy who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind. Mm -hmm. And between the release of that book, which I think was, what, 2011? Have you looked it up, Luke? Uh, and 2024, we have even more data that just demonstrates the really harmful effects of social media on the developing adolescent brain. What year was it? 2018. So 2018, so I was only seven years old. <laughs> Um, uh, but okay, so that, that actually just strengthens my point. Hey, pull that one up. Yeah, between 2018 and 2024, there's even more data demonstrating the the cause the, the the causal effect of harmful, uh, yeah, damage of social media on adolescent brains. And so, okay, I don't know the best way to handle that, but I know that it needs to be addressed. Yeah. I wish that all families would just sort of come to recognize this and right. put in put good measures in place, but they're not. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's crazy that 2018 is now like behind the curve. Yeah, that's right. Uh, all right, well, this show, uh, what are we talking about IVF this morning? How um, many viewers do we have? Who are we talking right to? Right now, seven. Okay, the, hey, the chosen seven, the number of perfections, yeah, right. the number of completions. Should it be any other number? Mm. Uh, yeah, if you're here watching, uh, let us know in the chat. Will this go up afterwards? It's up live. But I mean, like, after this is over, people will be able to watch it. Yeah. Okay, so there could even be 14 people by the time yes. this is all over. Yeah. Yes, 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 Grandpa. 15? That's, that's how you do wow. it. Wow, okay. Uh, hey, uh, I'm Grandpa, but you got your hat on backwards like a six-year-old. You know, I had to do that because when I put it on forwards, the light shadows my face. and uh, You never let that stop you when we record episodes of Defending Confirmed? Everybody's here to see my face. Yeah. I don't want to deprive them of that. So, uh, IVF. Mm -hmm. It's a, one of the things I want to talk about in the show. Intravenous fornication? <laughs> in vitro fertilization. Ah, in bad vitro, acronyms. In vitro fertilization. So this is, this is one of those topics that, I mean, I didn't know a lot about, mm -hmm. even though I had really well-formed opinions on abortion. Okay. So like as a young Christian, even like I knew abortion was wrong, had some strong opinions about it. Mm -hmm. And then IVF is one of those subjects where I hear Christians talk about it, and I knew there were very strong opinions on both sides, but mm -hmm. I didn't even really know what it meant. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, as a pastor, I've had to look into this just so my ethical foundations are there for being able to talk to, to other people, mm -hmm. other church mm -hmm. members about, mm -hmm. is this a good idea? Should you consider it? Is it ethically right or wrong? Um, well, you remember uh, after the fall of Obergefell, we as, as a church had to think, more thoroughly about what it means to be pro-life because we kind of pastorally our antennas were picking up the fact that people were happy to oppose abortion but that was kind of like all they knew about being pro-life they hadn't thought about things like ivf things like birth control right. so on and so forth so 
I mean, can you in a nutshell tell us what IVF is? Well, this is me in a nutshell. Help, help, I'm in a nutshell. Right? Uh, okay. Uh, I think your mic is I'll just on. call you on my phone. You think my, your my computer mic is on? You can just mute it. Oh, so I have to mute that. Yeah. And now I'm better? That's better. Ah, look at that. Yeah, that makes more sense. Somebody commented. And said yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm texting. Who are you texting? One of our guests. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a potential guest. So we have two state reps. Okay. Two different state representatives who are going to call into this show, or if we have time, two, maybe one. Not a congressman. Uh no, state reps. Not a senator. So state Congress, uh -huh. yes, but not federal, not uh, national. Okay. Um, yeah, there's Terry Collins. Uh Terry is actually is one of our state reps who lives here in Decatur. Uh, she's a Republican. She's okay. pro-life. Um, let, let's get in just a little bit about IVF so we can set yeah. up why we're asking her to be on here. So so IVF, as it's typically practiced, you have a, a couple who's struggling with infertility. Mm -hmm. That couple goes in through some medical procedures. They harvest uh, eggs and sperm. And then in a, a lab, they combine those, creating an embryo. And that embryo is then medically implanted into that woman. Uh, and the rest, so typically they'll freeze the rest of them. They'll like grade them. Which ones are the you healthiest? You said the rest of them, but you didn't make it clear initially that you can't just really do this with one egg. You have to do it with a bunch of eggs. Yeah, in large part because the chances of it working are poor. Yeah, that's and right. It's very expensive. Yes. So they'll they'll fertilize a whole bunch of eggs, make a whole mm -hmm. bunch of embryos. Humans. Human beings. Yeah. They'll pick the best one and then they implant it in the woman. The rest, and sometimes they'll implant more than one. Sure. Yeah. And then the rest sit on a shelf in a freezer, sub-zero temperature somewhere. Um, yeah. So this, if you're listening and you're a Christian and you have a, a strong understanding of, of the fact that an embryo is a human life mm -hmm. created in the image of God, you should already have some concerns about that human life sitting in a freezer right now for perpetuity. Yeah. I, I even wonder, we've gotten so accustomed so it's just talking about this like it's normal, although it's it's very much not normal and it's also very new. Does it when you when you describe that human beings, eggs, <laughs> human eggs, yeah, in a freezer in sub-zero temperature sitting on a shelf somewhere, does the dystopian nature of that just not hit you like a ton of bricks? Yeah, I mean, I wish it, I kind of wish it hit me yeah. more. You know, same, but like as I listened to you describe it just there, just now, I thought this is yeah. something out of a science fiction movie. Yeah. But it but it just feels so normal. It's crazy. Yeah. And I but I think that like I think the disconnect where you know we're we're just talking about embryos, you know, we're using medical jargon instead of talking about human children. And they're somewhere in a freezer where I don't see them. And in fact, they're so small I couldn't see them. Like I think all of that is aids in our disconnect from reality and causes people to think about these embryos as if they're not children. Um there's also the element of whenever you medicalize something, it feels like you sanitize it of any of its moral implications. Yeah. Which is why the abortion industry has tried so hard to talk about abortion like it's medical care for women. Yeah. Why they try to do it in, in, a, in a doctor's office and it all feels very antiseptic don't call and clean. It a, don't call it a baby. Mm -hmm. Call it a call fetus. It fetus. Even though fetus is just Latin for baby. baby. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if, if it feels medical, uh, it feels like, okay, then it's the, the moral problems are not there. Yeah, so so obviously we're showing our hand here. Like the way we've described oh, IVF. Oh, sorry, are we supposed to be gently leading up to No, I just, I think we may have listeners. I think we may have listeners who don't know if it's wrong. Oh, okay. And so they're hearing us talk about it like it's abortion. Yeah. Um, which I think in many instances, it is the same as abortion because mm -hmm. you're creating human life that you have no intention of doing anything with other than mm -hmm. just letting it expire, also known as die, Yeah. in a freezer somewhere. Um, now there... Like, I, I want to be careful here because a lot of people have, they wrap up their emotions with this subject because they've struggled with infertility. Yeah. Um, and infertil infertility is a, it's a heartbreaking, difficult thing that couples go through. And, and they see this as like a medical opportunity to overcome that. And so they just yeah. accept it uncritically. Yeah. Um, there are, I think, some really good arguments to be made for Christians to think about IVF and how it could be used in a moral way with like four key qualifiers. Okay. And the four key qualifiers basically boil down to this. It's got to take place between a husband and a wife. Mm -hmm. So a married couple. Okay. Using only their gametes, their sperm, their egg. Okay. 
Uh, so, so not doing the thing where like you take the sperm from another guy and add it to the egg of the woman. Yeah, that's yeah. surrogacy. Yeah, there's a lot of moral problems with that. Like the Even rights, more. the rights of the child okay. to be allowed to be raised by his biological parents. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's number one. Number two, no. This, sorry, sorry. This is what this whole yeah. show is going to be, I guess. But uh, if you get to the point where you're having to take sperm from another man to add it to the egg of your wife so that you can have babies. Uh, this, you've really made an idol of this and you've failed to accept the limitations that the Lord has placed on your life. Yeah. Amen. Somet again, sometimes you just need to say something out loud to understand. How mm -hmm. When you use the word like surrogacy, it just sounds so sanitized. Legal, yeah. But if I just explain what that is, oh, you're going to take sperm from another man yeah. and, and plant it in your wife so that you can have a baby. Well, now the, the nature of it is a little bit more clear. That hits a little harder. Yeah, okay. Number one, between a husband and wife. Yeah, the second one would be no selection of children, right? So you got a bunch of embryos. The doctor looks at them. Hey, that's the strongest. That one might have Down syndrome. This one's going to go in. This one's going to die in the freezer. Do they do that? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so no grading. Mm. Uh, the last one, no freezing. Actually, not the last one. Third Wait, last. Sorry, can you say why no grading? Yeah, I mean, it's it's eugenics. It's the idea that there are some human lives that are more valuable than others because of the potential or the reality of a defect. This is the same thing that the Nazis did when they just started killing children with mental retardation. Yeah, they just did that post facto. Yeah, yeah. this is just a, 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 a behind the scenes version of that that people don't see as clearly. So no grading of embryos and, uh, and no freezing them, right? So if you freeze a human child. It's like five guys and their beef. Like we don't have freezers here. It may be the same technology. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but yeah, like you shouldn't be freezing children with the anticipation that you might want one in the future. Uh, it's just yeah. a profoundly selfish way to view another human life as this is, I'm going to take your life. I'm going to put it on pause indefinitely. You yeah. may never grow. Yeah, you're, right. you're not a potential human. You're right. a human with potential, but I'm not going to mm -hmm. give you that potential yeah. until in my life I've decided I want you. Was that number three? That's number three. Okay. Last one. Uh, every embryo you create should be implanted in the womb uh, with a maximum. Usually people will say two or three because that's sort of the normal healthy number a woman could conceivably bear without significant risk. Right. Now, even in all that, there are some Christians who will argue this is still not ideal. It's not wise. Yeah. Uh, and I think for good reason. Okay. Like some of the things you've mentioned, like just the way that this technology disconnects God's design for sex to produce children. Uh, and I mean, birth control already disconnects those for us, right? Birth control is a way we can have sex without children. This is kind of the opposite. You can have children without sex. Um, I don't know what all the implications of that are for us, like taking God's creative design and using technology to sort of step around it. But we got to be careful when we do that, right? There's yeah, there's there's reasons that God made things the way he did. Actually, a good article for this view uh, the Gospel Coalition shared it. It's Breaking Evangelicalism's Silence on IVF, uh, 2019, by Matthew Lee Anderson and Andrew Walker. Okay, Andrew out of Southern Seminary. He's yeah. a good ethical thinker. Yeah, this is so this would be the, hey. Matthew Anderson is from Mere Orthodoxy. This would be the IVF isn't wise, probably shouldn't do it no matter what camp. And they make a good case. I don't know that I'm, persuaded by it because i do think there's something to be said to using medical interventions and technologies as gifts of common grace from god to and overcome the effects of the fall yeah exactly yeah. um but widely we should all agree that an embryo is a human being you don't kill it now the reason i'm bringing this up sorry before you move on yeah. don't forget what you were going to say i'm actually very sympathetic to this view probably more so than you I think what ends up happening is when you put those four guard, we'll call them guardrails in place, I think what you end up with is functionally, it's basically an impossibility to yeah. practice this well. And if you and, and even then, it's only capable of being practiced well by people who have the, the wealth to do so. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I think if you, you, you put all these qualifications in place, guardrails, yes, amen, that's good. And here's the very, 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 very narrow way in which you could do it. Okay. Theoretically, we have to leave that possibility open, but practically, I don't think there's an IVF clinic in our state that does that. Yeah. And I just don't think that, I just, I just don't think that's possible. No, yeah. I, I, the limits I'm putting on it are, are like platonic ideals. Yeah. 
I don't mm -hmm. think it exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and so given the situation with the way IVF is done today, I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't condone that practice to any Christian. Yeah. Now, having said that, maybe someone who would watch this episode will say, well, actually, I did all four of those things. Yeah. And by God's grace, it worked. We implanted two. I had, we had two babies. But even the idea of implanting three eggs for safety's sake. It's a risk. I just, well, it, it's just not the way conception takes place naturally. Mm -hmm. You know, your body doesn't typically implant three eggs in the uterine lining with the hopes that, you know, it's like one egg implants. Yeah. Every every now and then two, crazily, sometimes three or four. Yeah. But the body naturally doesn't function that way. The only time you're going to see really three eggs implanted in the uterine lining is when someone artificially does that. Mm -hmm. So even then, if somebody said, we implanted one egg... I would say, okay, I think that's good. Yeah. But then the odds of that one egg sticking, you know. Yeah. It's creating a human life and putting it at tremendous mm -hmm. risk so that you can do something that God in his providence has not allowed you to do with your body. Yeah, can you say that one more time? Because that yeah. was really good. You're, you're creating a human life uh -huh. and then using medical technology to put it in a position of risk. Yeah. So that you can sidestep what God in his providence has prevented you from doing with your bodies. That, that needs to be like an article in itself. I think that's kind of the headline. Yeah. Yeah. So this is probably deeper and more thorough than most Christians have thought about this issue. Uh, the reason we're talking about it is because uh, in Alabama, uh, there was a Supreme, Court, a Supreme Court, a state Supreme Court ruling a couple weeks ago. Luke, do you, do you find an article on that? Now, in Alabama, we don't have Supreme Court judges. We just have like a hog, <laughs> a, a turkey. <laughs> And some other farm creature that just sit up there in robes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, overalls. <laughs> overalls, yeah. that's right. So our Supreme Court dealt with a case where some human embryos, children, were in a freezer at an IVF clinic, and somebody like broke in there and knocked him over and killed Which him. Which is insane. Right. So the case was, uh, it went to the Supreme Court. It was it was like a, a lawsuit. Wait, now you said kill. Yeah. yeah. You meant to say that. I meant to say that. Okay. These children were killed. And it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, and this is all over the news, Alabama's a theocracy now because the Supreme Court looked at the law and there was a law uh, passed in 2019 in Alabama that basically made all abortion illegal. And the language of that 2019 law hinged on the sanctity of life and life being there and worthy of protection from conception, which means if you've got an embryo, you've got a child. And so the Supreme Court looked at the law, which was passed by Alabama citizens, and said, hey, our state calls embryos children and says they're worthy of protection like any other child. So, yeah, this place was at fault. Yeah, the logic tracks. Now, the problem with this is that as soon as... This might be our guest, Juan. Hello? Russell? Hi, is this Terry? This is Terry Collins. Great. Terry Collins, you're on the air. How's our audio sound? She, you sound a little quiet, Terry. Sorry. Um, I don't, it sounds to me, I've got my volume up. Okay. Um, are, are you on speakerphone, Terry? Yeah, are you on speaker? I am. I'm on my car phone. I mean, gotcha. I'm in the car, so it's on Bluetooth. That's okay. We'll make it work. Uh, yeah, so okay. Terry, we were, uh, we're live right now. We were just trying to update our audience on the Supreme Court ruling that uh, basically said that human embryos uh, are, are children and that these children deserve protection under the law based, I think, in large part on a 2019 law that they interpreted. Um, and that if I'm... No, it, some, yeah. no, no, some of that's not exactly right. Okay, fill it's me in. It's actually on an 1800 law about child endangerment. Okay. That's what they went all the way back Right. The um, 2019 um, Human Life Protection Act, which I did sponsor that. Yes. Um, that bill talked about in utero. So it was nothing to do with the IVF. It would be after the IVF process was done. Okay. Um, Alabama in 2017, I believe, maybe 18. Um, on the, um, when we voted, there was a constitutional amendment that made us, we voted as a, as 
Alabama to be a pro-life state. Yes. And the language in the Constitution is very broad and pretty, very vague, to be honest. It's just that we are a pro-life state and value life. Now, Terry, you're pro-life, so, correct? Yes. And yes. You're, you're a Christian, if I understand correctly. Yeah, I, I actually mentioned that you were going to be on the show to one of our members. Who I, I won't mention his name, but he's a successful local businessman. And he said, hey, I've been following her for years. She's pro-life. Um, now, now, do you... I actually started working with our Save a Life Indicator back when I was a young man in the 80s. Now, and I was a counselor for a while. I was on their board for a while, a long time, and have been a financial supporter since the 80s. So, yes. Yeah. So now to catch our, our listeners up, after this Supreme Court ruling from the state Supreme Court, which basically said that this IVF clinic was uh, essentially negligent or at fault for yeah for the death of yeah. these children, uh, the right. legislature came together and acted very swiftly. Uh, I think all, all voting on a bill that you proposed, right? To yeah, protect we IVF. To try to what happened was when the ruling came out, the clinics felt like their liability now, because of the way the process works, was too high. And so of the providers we have, the three largest stopped serving their clients. And the process for IVF is very invasive sometimes even painful and expensive and sure. families that were right in the middle of it, it was just very heartbreaking well let me ask um, you a question to try and get behind the the crux of this legislation and what the what the intention was there do you agree correct. with the supreme court's uh view that a an, a fertilized human egg, an embryo, is a human life worthy of protection under the law? I believe that the embryo that is frozen, it doesn't, it's no longer having a heartbeat. It's not surrounded by blood. It's not in the womb. I think it's still very much potential life. My understanding is that most of them, many of them are most, and I can't tell you which, don't actually become life, but that's why you implant so many. So is your trying to is your see. definition of um, so I think it should be valued, but as far as the Supreme Court, I agree more with Greg Cook and his dissenting argument would be closer to where I Okay. So it sounds like you you think that unless a child has a heartbeat in blood, it's not a human life yet? I believe it's a potential life. I don't know that I would call it a child. So that, that embryo has its own unique DNA, right? It is, Correct. If, if there was Correct. no human intervention there, if it wasn't put in a freezer, if it was, uh, if, if he or she were in his or her mother's womb, a child if would be born. In the womb, right. Like our pro life bill says, yes, okay. I believe that is a child that should be protected okay. under the laws that we already have in place. So you would yes. say an embryo is a human child if he's in a womb, but if he's in a freezer, he's not a human child. Well, I would say in a freezer, it just still needs to be valued and protected. Well, why? But I'm well, I believe it's a potential life at that point. Okay. It's my personal. So I now, guess I will tell you, Russell, people feel very strongly about oh, no, this right. issue and all over this issue. Yes, so that it's is definitely not true. Simple coming up with language that would provide some immunity so that those clinics could open back up. And they did, even the next day. Three procedures happened the very next day after the deal was signed at 10 o'clock that night before. So Terry, my, so, my concern, and I think the concern of a lot of Christians who've maybe thought a little bit more on this topic than the average person, correct. 
is that Correct. there's there's a logical inconsistency here. So if we say an embryo is a child if she's in her mother's womb, but an embryo in a freezer is not a child, then the value that we give to human life is dependent upon location. And that's the exact same argument that pro-abortionists make. And I believe scripturally, Russell, everything I've read talks about that child in the womb. This new technology, which was, of course, not even thought of in scripture being written times, um, but I do believe it's helping families all over be able to have families when they were not before. Yeah, and I think we would all agree that um, infertility is that life and that that new way to conceive and have a life in you. I think that it needs to be valued and protected. I don't know that I would go so far to say an embryo that's frozen and not in the womb is is a child yet yeah i, I just don't i just don't follow the logic the there well not not only not following the, the logic but don't become children well, that's the logic well terry the even even apart from children. even a first of all thank you so much for being on our show and being willing to engage in this of conversation right. with us yeah. but even the vast majority of secular textbooks biological textbooks address the fact and right. and, and it's been it's been unanimous for well over 30 years that life, in fact, uh, begins at conception, when when the sperm and the ovum unite. Not not okay. Well, that's conception when the sperm and the ovum unite to form a new being. And not when it's actually it, a little charge. There's a light. There's a I believe God inspired process that happens. But I believe when you freeze it, it it puts it. Hey, hey, Terry, crazy thought experiment here. If I had a one-year-old child yeah. and there was a way to cryogenically freeze that one-year-old child, would that child no longer be a life that was worthy of protection under the law? I apologize. I took a drink. Oh, that's okay. Um, that child is already a child. Well, why? So I don't see that being as similar because they're already a child. We're talking about a potential life. Well, what makes it what makes it potential and not a life? The majority, the majority of them don't ever. Right, but that's just that's a tautology. So you're saying that it's not a child because it's not a child. So I guess what I'm asking for is if you believe life starts at conception, which is the fertilization of I an think. egg with a sperm, what is it longer a life once it's frozen? Well, it's no longer surrounded by blood. It's no. It's not in a womb. It's not growing. But that's all just it's location. So location. Define, it's not any of the things that define a lot. I think it's inconsistent. And I'm trying to answer the yeah. best I can. Sure. Right. It is a process that's outside. And the other thing I really think about too is in this process. Law gets things wrong a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Laws are not the word of God and not inspired scripture. I think law needs to decide where we're going to decide to protect that life and not define when it is life. Right. So uh, doing another another quick thought experiment here. Uh, the reason why this matters so much to us is because if, if we get this wrong, what we're essentially doing is saying that it is okay to risk and almost certainly kill the life of several human beings in order to produce the life of one human being. So if, if you're if you're right and, you know, there's no blood and, and, the, and the environment doesn't matter. Hold on a second. If, if you're right. Well, then we're, we're, we're risking the potentiality of life. And that's still a little bit of a scary gamble.
But if you're not right, and, and I think our position is correct, that in the position of like biology textbooks, that human life, which God values as inherently, you know, full of dignity and worth, if that begins at conception, then what we're saying is with the IVF practice, we are willing to risk and almost certainly kill several human beings, take their lives in order to produce potentially one life. And that just seems like a gamble that's, that's very dangerous and unwise. And I understand what you're saying, and I think it's what makes the issue so um, controversial sure. and so hard to define in law. Sure. And what we tried to do was to take using just immunity and protecting the contracts and the families that are working with these clinics so that they could continue with their process. So Terry, you've been, you've been pro-life for a while. Very responsible with all of the embryos frozen and as they're going through the process. And those families then decide what they're going to do with those embryos that are very much potential life, but they are no longer growing. They are no longer implanted. They are not well, they've never been implanted, but they're not, there's no growth. So Terry, that, when I talk to people who are, when I talk to people who are pro-choice, I'm sure you've talked to people like this too. They'll say, hey, abortion should be completely legal because that baby, which they won't call a baby, they'll call it a fetus. They'll say if it's in the mother's womb, it's a potential life. It's not a child yet. And what they're really no, doing- see, I believe it is a life. Right, but Our but here's the key. That, and we already have a law that says that. Right, but why yes. do we have that law? Well, we have that law because you and I recognize that just because a human life is in a particular location, like in a mother's womb, doesn't mean it's not a child yet. Right? And I'm saying the same thing I is happening when you argue fair. that an embryo is not a child if it's in a freezer, you're, you're basically taking the pro choice argument that if it's in a womb, it's not a child. And you're just switching the word womb with freezer. And you're making the same distinction. That's, that's not a real distinction. And I see what you're saying. I just disagree. Sure. Yeah. Hey, real quick. I got one more question for you, Terry. This is a little more legislative. And Hey, thank you again, seriously, okay. for being on this show, having this discussion with us uh, and letting us push back on this. It really means a lot to us. Thank you. So, uh -huh. um, this this legislation happened fairly quickly. Uh, do you yeah, think there's any place? In five days. Yeah, five which days. Was very unusual for legislation. It's the fastest that legislation can be passed. Now, as yeah. you've pointed out, this is a very controversial subject where people have very different opinions, as as you and I do. And it seems right. to me, like given the complexity of it, uh, this would be a thing to maybe pump the brakes on and slow down and investigate. Uh, before passing a, legis a law that could potentially be causing thousands of children across the state to die in freezers somewhere? Was there any thought of like maybe slowing down and doing some investigation to make sure that that the law was, was well understood by everyone who's voting on it? I think that, yes, we've talked about, we did not address the actual issue that the Supreme Court ruled on. We simply provided immunity so that the procedures that those families were working through could continue and continuing to have that discussion and deciding what we want to do and put a task force together to study the issue that is very much still the intent. Okay, yes. so there, there's a chance that this is going to come up again and maybe some changes to the law. There could be, yes. Okay. Sean, do you have anything else you want to ask Representative Collins? Uh, no, uh, I know that the position you are in is very difficult, sister, and it's fraught with all kinds of stuff that I'm just thankful I don't have to deal with on a daily basis. And I want you to know that in our local church, we will be praying for you and others who are tasked uh, to deal with this, that you will uh, have an abundance of wisdom and insight because the lives of yeah, human beings I, are at I stake. Wisdom. Yes, and I appreciate those prayers. And I do believe that makes a huge difference. I know working with, I mean, I sat in a room with lawyers all around me most of those five days and trying to get language where everyone could agree because it was, it is very difficult. And a task force tasked with this 
because people are going to believe differently on every side, it's still going to be a challenge. And just because they're going to come out of a task force with a recommendation does not mean we're going to have votes to pass it. And right. people don't think about that side of it either. I mean, ultimately, to pass legislation, you have to have a majority of people that you can make comfortable this is the best thing for us to do. And on this issue, that's going to be very difficult. Well, Terry, what uh, what Sean just said is is not just a perfunctory statement. We really do mean that. We will pray for you as a church. Uh, even in this conversation, you can you can tell I disagree with you strong strongly. But uh, yeah. you're in a very difficult position, and we want to respect that and pray that God will give you wisdom as you uh, continue to serve our our county and our city as a representative in our state. Well, I appreciate that very much, and I do count on His wisdom, and I I spend a lot of time with him every morning to, to, to hopefully open up my eyes and ears so that I'm listening well to his direction. And so your prayers enable that to happen, and I appreciate it. Well, thank you, and thank you again for coming on the show. There are a lot of representatives, uh, maybe, who would not want to talk about such difficult things yeah. on the air. I mean, that's not an easy position we put you in, so thank you. Yes. Okay. okay. Well, I um, hope that we run into each other sometime in Decatur. I'd love yes, to meet you in person. Yes, ma'am. Have a good day. Take care. Okay. Y'all have a good day. Just hung up on her. Okay. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and pray for her right yeah. now. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for Terry Collins. Uh, we, we pray all the time in our local church that you will give us leaders who know you, who love you, who want to serve you. We understand that that does not mean that we will necessarily receive leaders who, even as Christians, make all the decisions that we think that they should or that they ought to. Um, but we pray that if she really does know you and belong to you, as if she really is seeking you and, and the wisdom of what you have to say about how to, to lead and to exercise authority for the good of others, if, if that really is true of her, God, we pray that you'll open her eyes uh, on this issue. We pray against all of the forces that may be pressing in on her, that may be blurring her vision, uh, give her a, a kind of clarity of thought and and um, a, a boldness to be able to do what's right for the sake of your kingdom. Lord, we do believe that she is wrong about this. We believe that she's dangerously wrong about this. So we pray that you will help her to see that. We pray that you'll help her to repent and and to make moves accordingly in her position of power. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so you want to break that down a little bit? Yeah, I think, I think that we will. Uh, I was really proud of you. I appreciate the good cop, bad cop approach you were helping me with there. <laughs> uh, let me just come in and say, yeah. we like you a yeah. lot. <laughs> uh, first of all, what my co-host is trying to say is thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So basically, um, she called a little early. So you guys didn't get the full behind behind the, the call context. But as you heard, Alabama rushed, rushed to pass legislation that would immediately take away criminal and civil liability from IVF clinics, mm -hmm. uh, contra to the ruling of our Supreme Court. So uh, this, this representative, uh, Terry Collins, she sponsored this bill. I was actually super impressed that she responded to my calls and emails and came yeah. on the show. Yeah, me too. Um, but you hear the logic there, right? We got to protect this because it's so important to families. Right. It's uh, There's a lot of expensive, difficult procedures going on. We'll figure out the details later. Right. And in in trying to figure out the details later, what, what we're really saying is, is this killing children? Not so concerned with that question right now. We just want we want the thing to keep moving. We want to help families have babies. Yeah. Which is why I did my thought experiment. Right. Right. If if we can if we have to kill four babies to get one, is because that's essentially what we're doing with this. Yeah. I think Terry's view is probably the majority view among conservatives. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they just haven't spent much time thinking about right. it. Right. And, and, brother, I thought you were so wise uh, to highlight the fact that she's basically just doing what pro-choice people do. Just location, location, yeah. location. Yep. So, yeah, yeah hopefully uh, that'll help some people think better about this. Yeah. I appreciated that Terry said that she goes to search the scriptures when when she thinks about this. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the all the language in scripture is about the womb. Having said that, why is that? Because <laughs> yeah. IVF wasn't around in uh, in Israel. That's right, and and she acknowledged that. But uh, if we're if we're, if we're making appeals to authority, which mm -hmm. appealing to the Bible is good, then 
I, I, I thought it was right for us to bring up the idea that all the biological textbooks, yeah. all the biology textbooks talk about life beginning. And she even said it. She said there's a spark, yeah. you know? There's yeah, and you, you can hear that inconsistency, right? Like, I believe that life begins at that spark. Right. When an egg is fertilized. But, but it's unlife once right. I freeze it in a freezer. You remember Bill Burr's uh, analogy about the cake in the oven? Uh, I do, but I want to hear you. Yes. Yeah, can well, you do Bill I, Burr's I, I wish voice? I could, man. I wish I could do any impression. But he basically says, like, if I walked up to uh, an oven with a cake in it that had just started baking, mm -hmm. and sorry, hold on, I'm getting called by my wife here. Uh, and I and I opened the oven, I took the cake, and I flung it across the floor. And you would say, "What are you doing to my cake?" And you would say, "That's not a cake yet. Yeah, you know, it's, it's still not being done, baked. Not done baking." Okay, well now let's stretch that analogy just a little bit further and take the cake out of the oven and put it on the counter. That's what she's doing. Exactly. But it's still all the constituent parts. I don't know. A cake is not a baby, so it's, on and so forth. It's the forth. same illogic. If I walk up to the mixing bowl with all the ingredients on the counter that's mm -hmm. just about to be poured into the pan mm -hmm. and I throw it on the ground, you're going to say the yeah. same thing. You, you, What are you doing to my cake? Yeah, the logic is, and that's why I brought up biologically uh, healthy one-year-old child. That was really good. Cryogenically yeah. freeze that child. Well, development mm -hmm. has stopped. Yeah. Right. So how is that child? Did that child like the embryo that goes in the freezer? Does that child mm -hmm. become an unchild until the right. biological processes start back up again? And to be logically consistent, she'd have to say yes. Of course, she didn't say yes. Right. Because it's absurd. Yeah. But the point of that illustration is to show that actually her view is the absurd one. Mm -hmm. If she would just think consistently about it. Yeah. I did not enjoy that very much. No, that's not your that's favorite, not my cup of tea. Favorite thing, huh? Yeah. Little, Especially when she would just keep on talking. I'm like, oh, this is driving me crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, I mean, I get it. She has to do this all the time. She has to spar. Yeah. All the time. I, you know, I don't know, though. I don't know that she gets a lot of media interaction where people you don't think push so? back like this. Okay. I haven't seen any. Well, I mean, what is, what is <laughs> AL.com going to come after her? <laughs> She's probably going on the local Coleman radio station, having some of these conversations. I mean, there are dozens of people paying attention to this interview. One hey, uh, dozen? Hey, Luke, do we, Luke, wow. do we have any uh, comments we want to address? Anything? Uh, somebody said she's taking the batter and placing it in the freezer. Taking the batter and putting it in the freezer, yeah. That's that's a really good comment, yeah. Yep. Hey, Billy Strobel, I think that's BJ Strobel, but we just, it's Billy Jr.? Love you, brother. Glad you're paying attention. Thanks for the encouragement. Wait, are you seeing? Oh, I'm I see a comment. I'm disconnected. I can't see the comments. Brianna Hill said, or Brianne, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. I'll just say Miss Hill. As an overthinker by nature, I absolutely detest when someone suggests to me that we work out the details later. Nope, we work out the details before moving on a decision. Well, maybe, but on something as important that's as a, human yeah, life. Seriously. Definitely. And that's, you know, it's, I brought that up. Because there were multiple representatives who said, guys, we're going to be killing babies. Please don't do this. Yeah, that's Let's right. just take a minute, think about it more carefully, spend a couple of weeks investigating this uh -huh. to make sure we make the right decision. Yeah. One of those representatives is uh, ready, to be, ready to be called here in about two, three minutes. Before we do that, before we call Ernie Yarborough, yeah. uh, let's talk about why they rushed this. It's almost certainly due to those interest groups, right? It's almost certainly due to those clinics that shut down and it, that's what she was saying, right? They they had to shut down immediately. Do you think it's owing to that, or do you think it's owing to something else? I I I don't like taking wild guesses at motives. Okay. But if I was to put money on it, yeah, I would say that the IVF clinics, which make millions of dollars, mm -hmm. hugely profitable, mm -hmm. uh, I would suggest that they got on the phone with their reps and said, "Fix this now." Um. I don't know that we could ever determine that. Right. It just stands to reason that they have so much of an incentive yeah. to put pressure on legislators to get it done immediately. Yeah. That that that's that seems to be where it came from. Russell, can you make a uh can you draw a line, a fairly straight line from this conversation to the gospel? Yeah. Because we're defending confirm the gospel. Some things are a little bit removed from that. But I mean, we've always talked about abortion and we think mm -hmm. this is in the same category. So help us make that connection. Uh, yeah, I think the straightest line to get there is the Imago Dei, right? Every human life from conception, we say is worthy of dignity and value and protection under the law. Not because of some mystical spark, but because that is a human life created, as Genesis tells us, in the image of God. We are 
unique among all of God's creatures. And so while we are also fallen because of sin, there's a part of us that is good. There's a part of us that God designed to be the way it is and loves and values. And so we ought to respect that. Um, and it's God's love for his creation and for us in particular that sent his son Jesus in the world to redeem us, to save us from the effects of sin and the fall uh, and, and pay for the price of, of our sins, sinners like you and me on the cross. So yeah, it's a it's an argument that I think people who want to be consistently pro-life, if you detach your view from the gospel mm -hmm. and just make it about pragmatic stuff, like, right. like uh, yeah, this is, uh, it's it's got a heartbeat, so it's a baby. Let's protect heartbeat. So like, what's special about a heartbeat? No, no, no. It's It's valuable because this child, he was made in the image of God, your creator. And so connecting that back to creation, um, there's a, there's not a lot of that in a lot of the big pro-life stuff That's that right. I see out there. Yeah. Uh, on that heartbeat note, I once had a doctor tell me that if you think a heartbeat is the only thing that matters for human life, then why do we ever try to save anyone when we lose their heartbeat in the emergency room? We know that even when their heart stops for a few seconds or Dang. even longer, right? We try to We try to bring that person back from the brink because there's still life there. Did you guys all hear that? That was good. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I stole it from that doctor guy. <laughs> what, what was this house? It was doctor. <laughs> it was actually the guy from Scrubs. Okay, yeah, the comedian. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yeah. All right. All right, well, are we ready to call Ernie? I'm calling Ernie. Now, are you bro. ready to get in there? Yes. All right. Yeah. Ernie's a talker. Ernie's a talker. Hello. Mr. Yarborough. This is... Uh, How are you doing, sir? Russell and Sean, you are live on the air. How's it going? Fantastic. Well, great. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So we've uh, we've been talking about IVF. We had uh, we had your girl Terry Collins on here not long ago. Very good. Yep. She yeah. uh, she put up with us, I think, very well. Yeah. Considering oh, how how much pushback we gave her, I think she handled it well. Sure. Um, sure. So two things that I wanted to ask you about. So you're you're a representative of our state. You're in Trinity, right? I am, yeah. So I'm District 7, which is a okay. small piece of Morgan County, all of Lawrence County, and about half of Colbert County. So you were you were intimately involved in this whole process where the, the legislature pushed through this IVF <clears throat> protecting law after the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, we asked Terry two things. We asked her whether she agreed that uh, the human embryo, which we call a child, is worthy of protection and dignity and and in all the same ways that a one-year-old child would be. Uh, she disagreed with that. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So no, I, uh, my first session, I filed a bill called the Equal Protection Act. And so the Equal Protection Act, the idea is that all life from conception uh, deserves equal protection and due process and cannot be robbed of its life without equal protection and due process. And so while there are, of course, inherent situations you have to cover, like what if a woman is made to seek an abortion under duress or a threat of violence, or if you have an ectopic pregnancy, right? There are, there are some edge cases to consider that can be handled, I believe, in a true pro-life way without mm -hmm. uh, without uh, uh, justifying or promoting abortion. So Ernie, uh, you're, real quick, you're uh, a Christian, right? I am, yes, sir. I, okay. I am. I am. Uh, I am a believer of raising a Christian home, and you know, I start. From, I start from the assumption and process that uh, that life, that all life, is made in the image of God. A human life is made in the image of God and uh, deserves equal protection and due process. Yeah. And, and now, so now what's so? Argument, sorry to pause you. I'm, I'm going to keep interrupting because sure. that's that's just my style here. Uh, no problem. To pause you on that, it's interesting that uh, Representative Collins, I think, would say the same thing. But she's kind of carved out this special gray area where though an embryo is, you know, has the spark of life, as I think she put it, if it's in a freezer, it's a potential life. Your thoughts on that? Well, I would disagree. And the reason why I disagree, there's several reasons. Uh, well, number one, uh, you know, the idea when the sperm and the egg meet, right, the, the, the miracle of life happens. And then, yeah, obviously, the, the, the next process is that the embryo has to be embedded in the uterine wall. Right. So um, that whole conversation around viability, look, when a baby's born, a baby isn't viable for years. Mm -hmm. OK, so so life 
for the first, I don't know what, five, 10 years of a, of a child, a baby's child's life, mm -hmm. it is dependent upon the environment and the environmental care that that child receives. Yeah. So viability is a stupid argument. To I me. agree. I, I, and I mean that respectfully. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, people get hurt when you say words like it's ignorant, but it is ignorant because yeah. And, I, and I'm not accusing anybody else of whatever. I'm just saying my my perspective of that as someone raised in a, a traditional Christian pro-life home, that life begins at conception and ought to be protected, uh, that the only – and which is why you hear Republicans on the floor of the House and Senate during this whole debate say things like, I don't know when life begins. Right. Well, right? and, and is, I think is, to your point, like is not, you, you said raised in a traditional pro-life Christian home. I, we're I think we're – realizing through this process that most people who claim to be Christians, who claim to be conservatives, have just not thought well enough on this issue to share your opinions. Well, listen, the, the reality is, is what the Supreme Court of Alabama did was give the most righteous, consistent ruling in the history of our country. And it's uncovered what see, there's a history here that you have to understand. Uh, it, it's uncovered the great dirty secret of the pro-life movement, right? The, the, the dirty secret of the pro-life movement in America is that they actually don't believe that life begins at conception. Now, that's not what they'll say, but when it comes to equal protection and due process, uh, that child is not treated as a, it's, it's, it's like a future potential life that's right. all of a sudden. Yeah. And so a, a few years ago, which so is exactly I, 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 how I, I, pro pro choice people want us to think about a child in the world. A hundred percent. And so once you start down that line, you, which is why people in the state house were saying things like, well, you know, well, it's not it's not really viable till it's embedded in the in the, mm -hmm. in the in the uterine wall. And so I guess I, I can vote for this. And like they, I, I was all of a sudden, like overnight, surrounded by all these people making pro-choice arguments for how they're going to vote, uh, who who would tell their constituents that they are a Republican pro-life candidate. And so hey, it was it was crazy. But, Ernie, you know, one a couple of, years ago, one of the things but, yeah. that that blew me away was you you were talking about how the 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 Democrat representatives who are obviously, you know, most of them are pro-abortion, were calling out the Republicans for being hypocrites. And they were right. Yeah, I, they were right. I like mean, they're exposing I, the know. flaw in the logic there, right? Like you claim that life begins at conception and that's your anti-abortion argument, but now you're protecting IVF and saying that, well, maybe life doesn't begin at conception in these situations. That's right. And, and, and it comes across like, well, if you, if you have enough money to afford IVF, then the destruction of embryos is not abortion, Ooh. right? But if you but if you do but if you don't have enough money to afford IVF, then all your only choice left with is is an, an illegal operation that destroys the same embryos. Yeah, right. And so and so it's it is. So it's the so IVF is, is is rich white people abortion is is the argument. I mean that's what was said. And and honestly though, I'm not a big I'm not a big fan of pulling out the race car because usually I feel like that that's that's done. Equal righteousness across the board, mm -hmm. right? Reverse racism is not helpful. We yeah. don't now all of a sudden need to apologize for being white. We need to assert the righteous standard of God's loving, fair, and holy law equally for all people. That's the that's the solution to racial issues, right? Hey, Ernie, not to real quick, Ernie, conversation, but one of but the other anyway, questions, so, one of the other questions I wanted to get your take on that I asked her was just about like sure. why was this thing pushed through so fast? Because I remember you and I think some other representatives <clears> basically said, "Hey." We all disagree on this. There's a lot of mud in the water. Let's let's pump the brakes. Think carefully about yeah. how we want to move forward because children's lives may be at stake. And the answer you got was basically, no, we're just going to sign this right now. That's right. Because the reality is that the IVF industry is for profit and that they don't want, I feel I, it came across like people in the establishment, Republican pro-life camp don't want to stop and think about this. They don't want to give mm. time for that. That's how it came across. Yeah. yeah, because the devil, the devil's in the details, right? Which is why a few years ago, when my, when the same bill for equal protection for babies from conception made it to the floor of the Louisiana State House, seven like around seventy pro life groups called in and told their Republican reps to kill the bill because they don't want to. Because the dirty secret of the pro life movement is is that they're not they, they don't believe that children in the womb uh, in Alabama right now are homicide laws. A woman could take a knife to her stomach. Uh, because a baby in the womb in Alabama right now is 100% not protected if the person taking the life of the baby is the mama. Wow. In our, in our in Alabama homicide laws, you look them up and you'll see. My bill was brought to address that. And as you can imagine, based on what's happened with the IVF, same line of argument, 
there's a lot of resistance to that because they they want to, you know, but that same mama, one day old baby drowns the baby. She's not held responsible right. for the life, taking, taking the life of the child. I didn't even know that. Only, That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ernie, my bills, my bills are to fix that, but our homicide where, laws literally remove the baby from all protections. Where can, mom is the where can our listeners, baby, so. where can our listeners, especially people in our neck of the woods, find out more about you and these bills? Luke yeah, so we're, we're, we're right now, yeah, right now, ErnieYarbrough.com. Uh, we're working on getting the website updated and getting it live with all kinds of things. So hopefully sometime in April will be a complete revamp, series of videos, all kinds of political stuff coming that will hopefully be a blessing and keep guys informed and gals informed as to what's going on. Great. Well, Hey, uh, we appreciate you being on the show. Um, we really do. Sean, you got yeah. him. Nah, brother. Thank you. Love you. Hope to see you around town before we let you go. Can I pray for you? Please. I yeah. need it. Lord, thank you so much for our brother, Ernie. Uh, we thank you that you have put someone who knows your son, Jesus as his Lord and savior in a position of authority where he can do good to those under his care. We understand how difficult, uh, this this battle is uh, on a, on a daily basis. It's not just uh, a political battle or a socioeconomic battle. Uh, it's also a spiritual battle. So we pray that you will strengthen his hand, guide his heart, and clear his path. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank All you, right. brothers. I appreciate y'all. Yeah, yeah thank buddy. you. Brother. Have a Take good care. day. See you, brothers. Well, uh, yeah. Luke, did you get his website? It's ErnieYarborough.com. Yeah. Come but on. he said he he as almost as soon as he told told us the name of the website he was like ah but it's old and bad and I'm going to redo it's it. It's probably so, like a MySpace page. Huh? Yeah, but if he proposed a bill, I bet you can just Google it. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you know he he uh to get elected, he walked door to door and knocked on like six thousand people's doors and just had conversations with them. Yeah, he was. I don't think he had any like he had no political background. Oh, good for him. Uh, pretty interesting example of just how you can make things happen locally yeah. that you probably can't yeah. ever expect to make happen nationally. Yeah. Um, you know, focusing on local politicians is, is a great start. Yeah. If you care about issues like this. One of the things that Matthew Martin's talked about in his book on reforming criminal justice was Christians are just so keen on thinking about presidential elections, but you can do far more by paying attention to what's happening with your local DAs, your representatives. I mean, Ernie's a bulldog, mm -hmm. one man by himself. I don't know how much, any one man can get done, but you've got to stop shaking that table. Am I shaking it? Oh, it's making me crazy. You're petting the oh, table. You're tapping I'm the tapping table. It, I'm tapping it. I'm scratching it. I'm soothing it. It's like you're trying it. to clean it with your bare hands. I'm giving a little bit of a massage. Okay. Ugh. Can you hear it? Or is it you just feeling the vibrations? I think it's just creeping me out more than anything. Like you have a sensory issue. <laughs> hey, speaking of sensory issues, uh, <laughs> maybe, that, maybe that's not a good segue. Sure. Uh, hoping to talk about neurodivergence yes next week yes uh, i put a little a little feeler little out question there. out there yeah. on uh on social media just asking people if they're aware of any pastors or theologians who've thought and written on the topic of neurodivergence mm -hmm. if you haven't heard that term you will and uh and and particularly just said like everything i see on this is just uncritically accepting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not to say it shouldn't be accepted but I would but like is to there see any some, divergent. I'd like point. to see some yeah. critical analysis of of neurodivergence before churches just rush to embrace a paradigm that is admittedly non medical and admittedly political. Now you're going to see all the thunder from your own episode next week. Well, no, because I I still don't know what I think about it. Okay, and so what I'm hoping to do next week is is get. Some Are you sure? Are you sure about that? <laughs> I, I think I I think I know what I okay, think. Okay, okay, okay. But uh, there's some areas that are blurry. Like I don't I think I could yeah. be corrected on some of my presumptions yep. about neurodivergence. But there's some areas that I think I know more than a lot of people using the term. Sure. Oh, sure. Because yeah. I've already noticed in social media people calling themselves neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, what do you mean by that? And they don't really know. Well, they they do know, but they give me a definition that is completely different than what I'm reading and all of the mainstream health yeah. resources that talk about the movement. So you said they do know, but you just said that they don't know. They know what they mean. They know what they mean. But they don't know what, what it, it the means. The originator, yeah. Judy Singer, okay. of the term meant, nor do they know what John Hopkins University is using that yeah. term to mean, etc. So like Singer rhymes with Sanger, and that's not a, an accident. That's a bad place to be. That's a bad place to be. Uh, any comments we need to look at, Luke? Before we do that, this neurodivergence thing, talking about the church uncritically accepting something. There is, I think now, especially over the last 10 years, uh, a pretty good track record 
of the church having to eat crow on uncritically accepting things and yes. then being like, uh oh, we should we should have done a little more homework before we just. I'll just use the easy example. Uh, I'm not trying to beat up on it again and again, but critical race theory. Yeah. The church just easily, quickly, readily accepted that. Oh, of course, you know. And then 10 years in, a lot of people are like, oh, we should have thought more about yeah. that. So we, we are addressing this because we're always ahead of the curve because we think this will probably end up being like that. Yeah. And yeah. the more I talk to people about this, even in the last few days, the more I can see there's a problem where people are using words differently. Uh, meaning different things by those words. And there's an ideological sort of bend in this package that's getting smuggled in. Yeah, it right. actually reminds me a lot of critical theory. Yeah. So we need to do some investigating. Sure. And what we would typically do is like, I'd research this for a few weeks uh -huh. and then we do our defend yeah. and confirm sort of Sunday school style series. Yeah. And we still might. We might still do that, but I'm just going to research it live. Yeah. And I'm going to let people give me comments. We've got some uh, fans of the show who've said, yeah, I'm, I'm neurodivergent. I'd love to hear comments from them, yeah. figure out what they mean. Now, back to the comments on this episode. Yeah. Somebody asked, what are our thoughts um, on the conversation between incrementalism and abolitionism? Well, who's somebody? I want to see this. Nathan Who? Kubrick, like the director. Nathan... Hubler. Nathan Hub Hubler. Oh, yeah. I see Are we going to set up our chat so that we only answer people's questions when they when they pay? Hey, can't we <laughs> can't we get the comment to like pop up on the screen? Is there a way to do that? Uh, yeah, there is. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Abolition versus incremental I don't know if argument. this is something you want to discuss. What is your view on the abolition versus incremental argument? Rep Collins brought up the need to get a law passed. Mm -hmm. People have to vote for it. Well, what's interesting is that the Supreme Court ruling that said embryos are humans, so if you kill one, you killed a child, was not based on a law being passed. It was just an interpretation of the laws already on the books, from our Constitution to the uh, the 2019 anti-abortion law. Like, basically what the court was doing... Hold on. There's a really good article on this. Luke, will you pull up... But this has to do with abolitionism it's versus incrementalism? It's, I'm okay. getting there. All right. I'm waiting for you to connect the dots. Luke, pull up a... Look for this article. WNG... No, comma, Alabama has not become a theocracy. So this is one of the most level-headed, best arguments I've heard on the Supreme Court ruling that came out of Alabama. As It's not a theocracy. It's not some activist Christian judge. Literally, the court was just interpreting our Constitution. And if they do that consistent, consistently, what do we get? You get abortion and IVF should be illegal. So this is from World children. Opinions. Yeah. Written by who? Uh, Weinberger, which is almost yeah. a great Lale name. Weinberger. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So really good article. Basically just ex explains like the court is doing what the court is supposed to do. They're looking at the Constitution and they're interpreting it through the lens of what did the people mean? And that's the answer they come up with, which is really more the abolitionist approach. Like just from from the the point of view of the abolitionists we want all this we want all abortion to be legal we want ivf if it is allowed to be completely uh free of abortion of freezing child embryos forever uh versus the terry collins comment about needing to pass a law um which would be the more incrementalist approach okay well we're allowing 10 embryos to be frozen. Those are children who will never be born, who are basically fated to die in a cooler somewhere. Well, let's make it illegal to do more than four. So now only four embryos can be frozen forever. And, or, and maybe 10 years down the road, we'll make it one. That incrementalist approach, uh, we see that in abortion with like heartbeat bills. I'm not a huge fan of that approach. I generally think it, it does what we talked about earlier which is detaches the problem of abortion from the reality of, of the gospel, that we're image bearers of God. It tends to lean towards pragmatism and inconsistency. But it has, I mean, I've seen it work. I've, I've seen it work. Yeah, okay. So I think you need to break down abolitionism at three different levels. You have the lexical level, yep. which is when I use that word, what do people hear? So even, You want it to stop. Yeah, but even then, though, I mean, you, you've probably seen some of the abolitionist protesters that would call what we do when we go out and protest outside of the abortion clinic, 
like not good enough. We're compromisers. Yeah. So there's abolitionist as a word, right? Which means I want abortion to stop, to be completely eradicated. Yeah. No half measures. Right. And then okay. there's abolitionist as a as a movement. Yes. Some might say a, a tribe. Yeah. And that tribe, I has has its own kind of culture. Yeah. yeah. And and it tends to be so extreme that. E Nine points out of 10 where you would agree with them. If you don't go to that 10th point, you're part of the problem. Okay. I mean, I've run into abolitionist guys who I completely agree with on abortion mm -hmm. who were not members of a local church because no local church was pure enough for them. Right. Because they didn't do enough. They didn't do everything that they thought should yeah. be done to fight abortion. And that's, yeah. a, that's a problem. Okay. So that's, that's the lexical level. Yeah. Then there's a the conceptual level, which is where I think we're going to find a lot of agreement. In theory, if, if we existed in a vacuum, we would say that the best way to fight abortion is to eliminate it ruthlessly because any half measures allow for babies to continue to die. And then there's the, the tactical level. And this is where I tend to lean towards incrementalism Be because we don't live in a vacuum. And I've, I've seen even on the left, especially on the left, that when significant changes happen at the national level in this country, they usually happen when movements chip, chip, chip away. I mean, that's how we got uh, gay marriage, you know? Right. So uh, <laughs> you, say, you say that like we won a great victory there. <laughs> Sorry. That's how we ended up that's, with, with gay marriage. Yeah, yeah, that's how we ended up. I mean, yeah. the, uh, the left was just very strategic for a few decades. And this was in their handbook, by the way, you know, they just very uh, slowly chipped away. And I think, I think by God's grace, that's actually what happened with the fall of Roe v. Wade. I think earlier I said Obergefell. Oh, my brain was fried. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think that's how we got rid of Roe v. Wade in this country. A pro-life movement slowly and systematically chipped away. Now, mm -hmm. there's more work to be done at the state level, but I would say that the incrementalist approach did a very good thing in our country, and the thing to do now is to not let off the gas pedal and to keep doing that at the state and local level. Yeah. Yeah, so in Any summary, pushback on that? No, I, I think I agree. I, I think in summary, uh, I'm, I'm really pressed to say there's one right way to go about ending abortion. But I do think there are ways that are clearly better than others. Yes. Amen. Uh, and I think some of the heartbeat bills and like, look at our Alabama laws that make it illegal to kill a baby unless it's the mother that does it. That's the kind of incrementalism that I do not like because it's so, uh, it's arbitrary. It's so arbitrary yeah. and it's been gutted of the fundamentals that, I mean, if, if a mother can kill her child then it must not be murder. Right. And if you're saying that it's murder, then why is a woman allowed to do it? There, that kind of inconsistency exposes the, the pro-life movement to challenges and critiques of hypocrisy that stick. And so that's the kind of incrementalism I don't approve of. As a, as a macro strategy of like, let's get the right people in the Supreme Court. Let's start moving states individually to make laws that ban this. I think that's fine. Yeah. And um, even if someone says to me, even, even if someone says to me, I don't like the heartbeat bills, but I don't think I can accomplish any more. But I think right now I can stop three quarters of the babies being murdered in our state. Mm -hmm. I think I can stop that by getting a heartbeat bill passed. Again, that's not the way I would want to do it, but I'm not going to be upset with them. Yeah. I appreciate that impulse. Right. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Hubler, hope that answered your question. Yeah. Another comment from him. Do you see that? Uh, researching live is a great way to speak out of ignorance. Well, thanks. Amen. Amen. Hey, that's a risk I'm willing to take. That's the whole point of the live show. Yeah, that's right. You get to see me being ignorant. Enjoy. Which means that we're going to hold a lot of what we say very loosely. There's going to be yeah. a, a very little thus saith the Lord talk when we're doing this sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to when we do our well-researched series, which we'd encourage you to go check out, Nathan, if you haven't already. Yeah. Uh, where we are, we take much stronger stances on things because we really think that <laughs> we know what we're talking about. Yeah. And that's something, I mean, honestly, I didn't plan it that way, but like our defending confirmed series that functions kind of like a Sunday school is where we really do what you just said. We do our homework. We speak confidently where we need to and make it clear. Uh, the whole point of this show is to do something way more loose, answer questions, yeah. interact with you guys. And uh, yeah, prepare, prepare to hear us say dumb things that we'll have to correct. Is this going to be released on audio? Like on our platform, like we're Podbean? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. Um, so I have a meeting today with a local pastor that I'll have to jump off of here at 1130. Yeah, we'll be done by then. I think we, well, I think we could probably go to 12, but let's leave the people wanting more, 
you know, all 12 of our of our listeners, our viewers, they're going to want more. But what else should we talk about before we do? Oh, he told us how to pronounce it. Hubler. Hubler. Uh, I'm sorry that you have that name, but I, I'm glad that uh, make the best of what you got. Okay. Hannah, what are y'all's thoughts on embryo adoption? Oh, I agree I, with everything you've said, but I'm wondering if you think embryo adoption falls into the surrogacy category. Hannah, uh, by the way, palindrome first name. Good job there. Oh yeah, I didn't even notice. Uh huh. That. I have one too. Uh, my name is also a palindrome. Oh no, it's not niece. Nice. <laughs> uh, me and my wife have been trying to adopt and foster for several years, and at one point we very seriously considered doing IVF adoption. Yeah. Uh, we ruled it out pretty quickly, one, due to the prohibitive nature of the cost. Uh, and then, two, there's something about implanting uh, the egg and the sperm of another human being into my wife's body that, to me, feels like it crosses the lines of God's predetermined uh I guess boundaries, right? It just it just feels unnatural in a way that we weren't particularly comfortable with. So that's that's how we thought about it. Russell, what do you think? Uh yeah, I so I actually am gonna lean on a uh Erica Faust, is that her name? Who wrote I don't know. the book Them Before Us? Oh, that's such a good book. Yeah, yeah I remember so her name. This but book yes. is actually in the show notes because I expected somebody to ask about this. Good. So uh Erica Faust, Them Before Us, she wrote a book that basically helped me to think outside of the adult me centric yes. thought process that our culture is so prone to do. Even I was prone to do, uh, and to start thinking about the rights of children. Yeah. Even children who've not been born yet. So we all believe in parental rights. That's right. But, uh, an implication of that must mean that there are children's rights. Yeah. And those rights include things like the right to be raised by your biological mm -hmm. mother and father, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not to be traded or sold or uh, or swapped around between different adults who want a child that they can't have. That's right. Uh, and you, so you see the worst of this, I think, in the kind of surrogacy with uh, two gay men. Yeah, that's right. Right? So they're basically buying a child mm -hmm. from that child's mother. Mm -hmm. Well, what about that child's right to be raised by his mother? Right. Like who... Who advocates for that child who mm -hmm. can't even speak? Right. And right now the answer is nobody. Mm. Uh, so I would have big concerns about adopting an embryo uh, yeah. for that same reason. What about this, Russell? What if someone says, okay, I agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. And let's say we outlaw IVF stuff tomorrow. Nevertheless, there are a couple of million human beings frozen across the country. Should we enlist a small army of women to save those babies' lives? What do you think? I mean, it doesn't have to be such an extreme scenario, but l l again, outlawed tomorrow, there are still babies who are in a freezer. What should we do with those babies? Oh, I have no idea. So, so this leads what me back to question. a recent conversation that we've been having around the church about the lesser of two evils yeah. and you know, so on and so forth. In my mind, though, I do think it is not good to do this. Yeah. I think if we could save those babies' lives, yeah. I think I would make that compromise. That's my impulse. Yeah. Is like, open it up to any woman who wants to adopt and save the life of a child who's been abandoned, right? That's right. This That's is not, right. this is not, Hey, you have a, you make an embryo and then I'll take it. Yeah. It's not a economic transaction. It's uh, Hey, there's a bunch of children who live in a freezer right now. Mm -hmm. No one's wanted them. They've been abandoned. They're going to die. They're going to die. Yeah. Unless you take one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I bet there'd be willing and I bet there'd be Christian women lining up to do that. Yeah. I'm sorry to say this again, but I just can't help it. Just think about the crazy dystopian world we live in. Yeah. If, if because they're eggs, and like you said earlier, not visible, mm -hmm. and you can put a thousand of them in a freezer somewhere. But imagine if we had like five million human bodies, like fully developed human bodies frozen somewhere. Yeah. It would feel like we were in there'd the be, matrix. There'd be photos of it all over social media. Yeah. 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 Right now, it just sounds like we're talking about a thought experiment, but there are yeah. over a million human children yeah. in freezers around our country Can you right Google now. that? Did you Google it just now? Yeah. No, not right now. But how, I, how many are there? It. Just Google. Because I said several million. I thought that that was right, but so Luke, you, <laughs> statistics in the internet. Luke, you Google that. I'm going to do one more thing on this show before we go because I want to test it. Uh, we actually have a number. I'm going to put the number in the chat. This right. is our show number. 
And so people can call in. Yeah, people can call in. I see uh, T.C. Joseph. He's a friend of mine. Uh, maybe he'll call. Well, T.C. Joseph says, kudos to Russell for being the best dressed man in the room. Now, yeah. first of all, you can't even see every man in the room. <laughs> you, you, yeah, but he can see those shorts, can he? Okay, but you if I were to stand up, I think your opinion would change. <laughs> I have a weird body when I'm in a sitting position. Okay, so I just I just put out a number, uh 256-808-9068. It feels like we're back in the 90s. Call in at 256-555. Hey, would you really have a problem if we went back to the 90s? Not at all, dude. Because the 90s were amazing. They were amazing. And I didn't know it while I was in them. Yeah. And I wish I had. Let's go back. Yeah. It's uh, two different estimates, the health and human services. Six hundred thousand. Okay. Well, the National Embryo Donation Center puts the figure close to one million. Okay, so about yeah. one million. I, th I thought it was between, a million. between six hundred thousand and one million, that but that's a lot. Be, it must be where I got that number. I mean, when you start getting into the hundreds of thousands, I mean, we're talking about human beings. Human beings, yeah. That's so right. either of those numbers is enough mm -hmm. to have significant concern. Yeah, that's right. All right, I put a number up: two five six eight zero eight nine zero six eight. If you want to call that number and test our call in for questions. Be my guest. Be my guest. See who uh, bites. Am I the only one that's going to sing Beauty and the Beast right now? Apparently. Okay. If we don't get a call, we'll just wrap it up here. Russell, do you know what the zero said to the eight? Don't do this. No, he didn't say that. He said, nice belt. Oh. Uh, do you get it? Because if you put a belt around the center of a zero, <laughs> it would form the shape of an eight. Uh, nice belt. Uh, Dom, Dom, you were a bit too slow on the punch, baby. Dom, why don't you call that number? I just want yeah, to Dom, I, I just want man. to test this thing. Yeah, we're going to test it. We are really running on fumes at this point. Yeah. Uh-huh. Luke, uh let's talk about you for a minute while we're waiting on Dom. Uh thank you for doing this. Were you, were you do you feel voluntold to do no, this? No, were you happy no. to do it? Very because I feel like sometimes when there's something that needs to be done, you just end up doing it, and I don't want you to ever feel like we're taking advantage of no, you. No, I love, I love it. I think this is a good conversation. Good. Now, blink twice if you're under duress when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw one blink. Can you put the phone number in the chat? I just did. You just she, Hannah, you gotta pay. Wait. Tom says, "What was the number?" I, don't, I didn't see it. it didn't. I, I don't see it in the oh, chat it's either. Because, just so you know. it's because I put it in the chat as yeah. Russell Berger. Can what? you put it in the chat? Yeah. I just texted it to you. 256. Wait, why can't you put it in the chat? Hush. 256 808 9068. So I, I put it in the chat as Russell Berger. Okay. And the way I think the way people see the chat and what comes into it is not always the same. That's and, weird. But if the if the streaming channel puts it in the chat, it like highlights it. So like if defend if Luke over there on the defend and confirm. YouTube account puts it in. It should yeah. just pop on everybody's okay. screen. Hey, phone ringing on your cell phone. Dom, what's up? Hello. Wow, our very first non-state representative guest, oh, and now, we, somebody's beeping in. Now Joe's trying to call. Who? Uh, uh, his name is TC Joseph. I'm calling him Joe because I'm right. not giving out his name on the air. Dom, Ooh. tell me real quick before we let you go. What was your favorite part of the show? My favorite part of the show was um, Russell's interaction with um, Terry, I believe it was. Yeah. Yeah. Just, like, just like our normal defending and confirm, Russell's good. always the best part of what's right, happening. That's what I here. wanted to hear. Thanks. <laughs> right. Thanks, Tom. Bye. <laughs> Love you. Bye. All right. All right. I'm going to call Joe now because he just called. Who? Uh, who's Joe again? Your friend? Yeah. Yeah. TC Joseph. I don't like this guy. Look at that comment. I think you are doing a great job, guys. Didn't hear anything that I would consider speaking out of ignorance. That's a pretty low bar. <laughs> Joe, are you there? I'm here. No, the one guy said you guys were speaking out of ignorance. I don't think I've ever seen a podcast you guys do where you're speaking out of ignorance. Just wait. Yeah, give us time. <laughs> All right. No, so I mean, you guys definitely have opinions that other people might not share, but that doesn't mean that they're not well thought out. And That's right. Not well conceived. Hey, did you see the the whole show? Did you hear our calls with the two state reps? I did. I thought they were pretty fantastic. I I was um the 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 woman was it I was you were giving her no wiggle room. So I was wondering how how she was gonna get out of this gracefully. And Sean really did save the day. <laughs> he gave her the easy out. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right, Joe. Well, hey, thanks. I'm glad this system works. Uh, yeah. yeah. Call in again next time when we're in the heat of the battle. Yes. The, listen, I think you guys are doing a great job, and I like the live shows. I hope you keep doing that. Thanks, bro. We do too. Now, listen, this will only work if people actually share these links and the, the audience grows because – if we're doing this two months from now and there's still only 12 people, I'm out. <laughs> I'll hold down the fort. All right. I'll just be in here by myself with my three viewers. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hey, check the show notes. Again? Who is this? Someone from Indiana. Not no, Indiana. No, not we don't that. answer calls from Indiana. Next time, whoever that was. Yeah, sorry. Um, we love you. Next time. Yep, next time. Uh, yeah, so check out the show notes. Uh, we've got some resources for you. Also, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and ask to be notified for our scheduled live shows so you don't miss them. Yeah, that's right. All right, let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for giving us this time and this opportunity. We want nothing more than to be good stewards of the resources you've given us, our time, our talent, uh, our treasure, your word. Help us to be faithful uh, so that we can hear on the last day, well done, good and faithful servants. We pray that uh, any of your children who tuned into this were blessed by this conversation. Uh, help us to set an example for the saints of what it looks like to dialogue charitably over complicated and thorny issues. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Kill it.